in nomine partridge, at fillet of herring, in spirit of camphor. Amen. Well, I'm your funky flunky, and I think I'll have a lie down after this. Lorks and mussy, what's a Titian-haired young Adonis with the body and teeth of the ancient Heracles doing lying here, limp, listening for a royal flush? I'm exhausted, but they've seen a decent bunch, and my masculinity isn't in question. So far, so good. I'm missing it myself, but, well, many of us couldn't go, but all over the world there was keen interest. Bubble, bubble, larger bubble, balloon lettering, thinks. In the Queen's arms, for instance. This is the left one, beautifully white and clean, isn't it? And the regalia, the big silver one on the breast, was one at Munich for trampolini. However, back on the home front, trouble for the palace guard. The Rawlinson family, all 27 of them from Hartlepool, are trying to crash the party. They've been repulsed, but this is only a ploy. For round at the tradesman's entrance, the rest of those rascals are scaling the gate. A few more won't hurt, says the bride graciously. And let them eat cake. But only a trifle. <laughs> First, a spot of sherry, medium wet from the royal stables. What, no cherry with sherry? No matter, the cake is absolutely delicious. And who could resist a bit of regal crumpet? But for connoisseurs, cormorants, gourmets and gannets, something special, a zebra with a broken nose, a nice bit of streaky to put a smile on anyone's plate. And could they keep him away? It's Lord Howard making a sneaky, a surreptitious, but sporting arrival in the grounds. <laughs> yes, security has certainly had to be tight. And in the mall, a sight to water the eyes of any window box owner. Mingling with the crowd of revellers and completely undetectable except to the naked trained Alsatian overcome by the fumes, are policemen, our policemen. Here's special branch man, P.C. Gibbons, enjoying a piece of marzipan. Mm -hmm. And the costumes of the crowd, all pomp and circumcision. Here an almost Nuremberg burst of appreciation. Not surprising how tired the royal couple look after all this brouhaha. A quick peck for the cameras, and they cheerfully sweep up some of the inevitable talcum powder fallout from all those long dresses. And after it all, back to the palace for a few stouts and a sing-song. But where's Uncle Phil? Uh, uh, and he's still got his cotton wool earplugs in. Mark sinks a swift in. And the Queen Mother, no stranger to a glass of Chateau Tilbury, joins them in song. Indeed, a day to regurgitate whenever families meet. In conclusion, have you thought of having your tongue painted? Whilst all this negotiating, swindling, wheedling and whining was going on, what were the public doing? Taking it out on defenceless poodles, bending spoons? No, not a bit of it. With typical British good humour and typical British phlegm, they were spitting at each other. However, for those who wanted to, getting to work was a bit of a problem. Here, two bank managers, nine accountants and three humble property speculators, all suitably dressed for the office, set off for the city to the jeers and victory symbols of the idle and unemployable. Last one on's a sissy, and there he goes. Leaping as a way of getting from A to Y isn't receiving much attention, so let's take a butcher's at two sturdy and determined chaps pitting their thighs against some of the strongest frogs in the country. Whoops! Oh, nearly squashed the opposition. But no matter, it's a magnificent leap of 15 feet 10 inches. And in the frozen wastes of Wolverhampton, nutcases were trying their feet at skiing. The one in front is the nut, and behind him the fruit. The man training them is completely normal. Whoops. Skilled stuff, but it takes muscle and the breath of a rhino to get your hands on those all too last minute Christmas goodies. And it was on one of these frantic excursions that Mrs. Snarling and Mrs. Jostling came face to face and provoked the country's first trouser event. In they dashed, wild-eyed and expectant. Then they saw them. Trousers, 150 per pair. 
Mrs. Jostling spotted a pair of white polar bearskin loons that would look just wizard on her Ted, but Mrs. Snarling had grabbed them too, and Mrs. Jostling turned round and said she'd seen them first. Then Mrs. Snarling turned round and Mrs. Jostling turned round, and after several of these revolutions, it was decided that a trouser vent was the only way, and so it was. Snarling's Ted adjusting the special trousers worn for the event, and Mrs. Jostling's champion striding to the trouser area. As you can see, there's been quite a turnout for this increasingly unknown way of settling a dispute. They couldn't very well do it in court because trousers can't be taken down and used in evidence. Uh -huh. And yes, he's got a cross buttock, I think so, but will he, will he get him off? He's trying, he's got his head down, and the crowd are getting very excited. There's nothing they like more than seeing a spot of body. And whoops, he's down. And let that be a lesson to yes. But some of the crowd aren't happy about the decision. And to give an idea of how rough the trouser event can be, have a doss at this. <laughs> Mrs. Jostling laughs, and Mrs. Snarling laughs too. Well, I suppose they all had to have a laugh about it afterwards. The legs were parted, and both parties went home with a bit of the action. The big rabbit was only chilly in one ear, and Ted Jostling wore his half as a turban and defied the authorities on his two-stroke moped. A Sikh joke, perhaps, but to those of you doing an unpleasant and underpaid job, let me say this. Be realistic. Ask for the impossible.